so much, Cheryl. I really appreciate having me on. And I just love being a part of these conferences that you hold throughout the year. So thank you so much. As I know, it's very beneficial to uh, family caregivers, but also healthcare professionals in the industry too. So so thank you again. Um, so, you know, uh, just to talk a little about, you know, how I got into this industry, being a clinical psychologist, actually my first part of my career was strictly in mental health. Um, and then I kind of fell into senior living like a lot of people do, um, but a lot of people usually fall into senior living because they had someone that they were caring for, you know, mom, dad, or brother, sister, something like that. And and my journey is a little bit different, actually. I started working with seniors in my postdoctoral experience uh, at Northwestern University. I was doing research between Northwestern and the Heinz VA um, and really supporting seniors in learning how to adapt healthy lifestyles into their day to day and just absolutely fell in love with the senior population. I had really not worked with them before. And then after that, after I graduated from my postdoc, I moved into senior living uh, and worked on the behavioral health realm, but then quickly was kind of recruited into memory care as the company that I was consulting with really needed a lot of support in that area. And so I had the opportunity to be able to kind of revamp the entire program from the ground up uh, and be able to really train and educate and implement a thriving program that they know today. And so, you know, I, I just really fell in love with working with people with dementia, their families, the staff. It was just such a dynamic uh, experience for me that I knew this was my calling. Um, and so the rest is history. But you know, really in that time, I had the opportunity to develop that model of care that you talked about, Cheryl, dementia connection model, had the ability to uh, be able to implement it and collect data on it and then pitch it to Johns Hopkins. From there, we wrote a book together uh, that came out in 2021. It's called The Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advance Alzheimer's Disease, which you can really find anywhere at anywhere books are sold. Um and from there, then created the Dementia Connection Institute with myself, and I'm a business partner. Her name is Jessica Ryan. She's a biologist. And putting our heads together as a small, you know, female-owned business, we really thrive on trying to educate people as much as possible. So at the Institute, what we do is we provide a lot of education and training, uh, not only to healthcare professionals and organizations, but we actually work a lot with family caregivers. So we're the first institute open to all types of caregivers, no matter your status. And so we do a lot of that. We also provide consultative work. Um, so neuropsych evaluations, we develop programs for organizations. We work one-on-one -on -one with families to help them through the journey um, and really providing that support. And we have a lot of resources on our website, dementiaconnectioninstitute.org. Uh, we've been on a number of podcasts, um, featured in magazines, things like that, that are free to you on our website. So hopefully you'll you'll check us out there. Um, but I wanted to dive into what is the Dementia Connection model before I kind of talk about, I want to focus a lot on olfactory stimulation today, as it's one of the most powerful ways that you can connect to someone living with dementia. So the Dementia Connection model was developed over a 10-year period of really uh, educating people, seeing what they understood um, you know, looking at how do we connect to people from a physiological and a psychological perspective, and then with what tools, you know, what can what are tangible tools that any caregiver can use when they're working with someone to really facilitate that connection. So the dementia connection model is a framework. Okay, it's uh, three pillars. The first pillar is more of an explanation of what's happening as the disease progresses. So. That is called the theory of retrogenesis, okay? Has anybody heard that, the theory of retrogenesis? If you have, throw it in the chat box. That theory, I did not create that. That was actually developed through years, extensive years of research um, from Dr. Barry Reisberg, who I highly respect. And he's kind of one of the founding fathers, if you will, in dementia care. And he found through his research that as the disease progresses, the individual is, all their skill sets are moving towards a more younger state, if you will. Okay, all skills. So their ability to walk and talk and take care of themselves and cope with stress, all those kinds of things. And why is that important for us to know that is because as caregivers, when we look at the people we're caring for, we see them as an adult. So our expectation is, 
people they should be acting. They should act like adults. They should have the maturity of an adult. They should have the skill set of an adult. They should be able to pay their bills, drive, navigate, you know, even, you know, brush their teeth, all, all those kinds of things. But the reality is, is when someone has dementia, because their brain is deteriorating slowly, they don't have those abilities. And so what Dr. Barry Reisberg found was that the brain actually looked very similar to a, anywhere from a seven-year-old to a four-week-old. Okay. I'm going to say that again, a seven-year-old to a four-week-old. So developmentally, that person is not where we expect them to be. So because if we accept and know that, we can lower expectations of what that person can do and really work with them on trying to support them with what skills they still have. Okay. This is not about treating them like children uh, by no means. It's about understanding that's what that fit first pillar is. And so to further kind of talk about what is that life like for a seven-year-old to four-week-old? Well, we have to kind of go back because I'm sure some, a lot of us don't remember what, what was it like when we were five years old. But what that is like is that their world is different than yours and I's. Their world is very much reliant on their senses to navigate, communicate, experience everything. I mean, think about this, right? How did we all learn how to initially walk, talk, feed ourselves? We didn't pick up a book and read it. I mean, that would be great if children could do that, but that's not the case. We teach them those things. So they watch, they listen, they mimic with tactile kinds of things, right? And they eventually learn how to do it on their own. So we have to say, well, since someone living with dementia is experienced in the world like that, wouldn't sensory stimulation make the most sense? Bing, 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 bing. Yes, it would. So that's another pillar in the dementia connection model. That's the tool we're going to use is positive sensory stimulation. Okay. Now, why is that? Why is sensory stimulation so powerful for any human? It's because when we take in information through our senses, it actually ignites our limbic system. This is that physiology part I was referring to. The limbic system of our brain has two important organs. One is our amygdala, which helps generate emotions, and our hippocampus, which generates a memory. So when any stimuli comes in, it actually ignites our mood and our memory, either in a negative or positive way, depending on what how we perceive that stimuli. And then the psychological part of it is that once our emotions are ignited, it actually influences how we act, our behaviors. Okay. Um, and so when we think about people with dementia, we want to try and either remember what works for them or create and trial positive stimuli, you know, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're tasting, touching, smelling. We want to ignite those and bring them into the caregiving experience so they feel positive emotions, positive memories of that event and with you, okay, which then psychologically will ignite their behaviors or positive productive behaviors, okay, whatever that might be for that person, whether that's they want to feel calm or they want to feel excited, you know, things like that. Um, and so, and why psychologically, just to kind of stop for a moment there is because if you're familiar with cognitive behavioral theory, right? Cognitive behavioral theory says that what we think influences our feelings and our feelings influence our behaviors, right? So that's the psychological side of it. So the third pillar is habilitation. And what that simply means is we're going to do the sensory stimulation thing over and over and over and over again. And we're going to schedule it, okay? Uh, there's a, a, a discussion in, in our industry talking about social prescription, okay? Who has heard of that? If you've heard that, throw it in the chat box. Because social prescription is really about prescribing social kinds of tools, right? Interactive social kinds of tools rather than necessarily only medication, right? Um, and so with habilitation, what we're going to do is we're going to schedule these tools throughout the day so we can reinforce the skills that a uh, person living with dementia still has. Because you may have heard consistency is key with dementia, right? Very similarly to how children really operate really well, too. And so we're going to do this over and over so we can reinforce the skills and, uh, and habilitate that person so that way they can be as independent as they can be for as long as possible, right? So that's the dementia connection model. We're going to remember what works for someone because they're progressing towards a younger state, which is sensory stimulation. So we're going to use that sensory stimulation to have a physiological and psychological reaction. And we're going to do this over and over again with habilitation, right? We want to reinforce those skills. So we're going to set this up in a structured manner, right? Every day. 
So the one sense I want to focus on uh, for my time remaining is olfactory stimulation. Olfactory stimulation is probably the most powerful stimulation you can use out of all five senses. The reason being is because think about how our limbic system is work, works. Essentially what it is, it's actually a direct line from our nasal passage to our limbic system because the olfactory bulb sits at the base of our limbic system, right? So I'm kind of kind of give you a little visual here. Here's our olfactory bulb. It's like a little curve and our limbic system is right here, right? So there is um, an almost immediate effect when we smell something, okay? Because it can work within seconds, okay? So with other stimuli, it's still very effective. It just, it goes to another part of our brain first, and then eventually goes to our limbic system. So it's a little bit longer, maybe more of a minute, right? There's not a huge difference, but olfactory can be very important because you may have known through the years that, you know, we we have a, we attribute certain smells with experiences, again, good or bad. Um, and it sticks with us for the rest of our life. We might smell something now that reminds us of something 20 years ago, right? And so it just is a really powerful sense, right? So with olfactory, as I mentioned, you know, we take in information through our nasal passage and ignites that limbic system of the brain, which then influences our behaviors, right? So we want to think of what are some good things that are the people we care for? What do they love to smell? Is that flowers? Is that fresh brewed coffee? Is that uh, fresh baked bread? You know, those kinds of things that can really ignite some positive feelings. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, don't people with dementia usually lose their sense of smell? The answer is yes. A lot of them do. Not everybody, but a lot of them do. Um, especially, you know, more specifically in Alzheimer's dementia. So we talk about, well, we can try to exercise their sense of smell so that way they decrease the chances of losing it, right? And that's where I would highly recommend there being some kind of therapeutic um, aspect to this where you're working in every day their ability to smell something and identify it, you know, so you could put pungent items in jars for them to identify and smell um, or, you know, you know, have an activity around it. You can do baking and cooking, have them identify different spices that they smell, you know, things like that, just to exercise it. Just like we have, we should exercise our brain by doing brain games, or we should go to the gym and exercise our muscles. So we remain strong and sturdy, right? So we should exercise our sense of smell, too, before they lose it. Now, if they did lose it, okay, the main olfactory tool that you can use is essential oils, okay? Now, you may have heard aromatherapy and dementia care, and, and a lot of people are kind of getting on the bandwagon with it, which is fantastic to see. But I want to educate you a little about why using essential oils. Why is it effective if they can't smell? The reason being is because when essential oils are diffused into the air, they break down into very small particles. It's the only known substance that can cross the blood-brain barrier and have an impact on that limbic system, which is what we want, right? Because we want that physiological and that psychological reaction. So regardless if they can tell if it's a lavender, if it's a rosemary, if it's a cedarwood, it doesn't matter because it's still going to impact their brain in a positive way. Because there are specific oils that have been tested in research that show a positive remark on certain symptoms of dementia. There are a plethora of articles out there that indicate this. And I'm going to go over a few before we end. So what happens is when we smell in an essential oil, it is actually impacting our blood-brain barrier and crossing the blood-brain barrier, going into our limbic system and having a positive influence in our brain. Now, if they can still smell and you're using essential oils, do have them test it out. Like have, you know, put the bottle underneath their nose to see if they like it. And you can tell they might have a, you know, a, a scowl on their face. They might decide they don't like that. Then don't use that because they're going to start attributing that smell with a bad thing. So then you want to use smells that they do like. But again, if they can't smell, it doesn't matter. You're going to just look at the therapeutic benefit to say, I'm going to go ahead and use this oil. So let me just back up. If, you, if they can smell and they don't like it, you know, there is another oil that does the same thing that you can use that may have a more positive effect. So, for example, maybe you go and you and they can still smell and you have them smell lemon and maybe they don't like that sense of smell for lemon. So uh, with that said, what you might do then is um, 
choose a different citrus. Maybe they like wild orange better. Okay. Um, so it does the same thing. It increases appetite. It boosts mood. Um, and so with that said, you know, you can just switch the oil and there's always another oil that can do the same thing. So, but let me get back to if they can't smell, again, there are certain oils that can help ignite that limbic system, right? So when we talk about essential oil use, let me just talk a little bit about what is an essential oil. Uh, briefly what it is, it's actually when you smell a flower or you, um, you know, you can smell kind of herbs in the, um, in your garden, that's the actual oil you're smelling. And how they get that out is they actually steam distill or they extract it uh, from the plant or tree itself. Um, and then from there, it should be bottled. Okay. Um, and so you know, when I say should be, you know, everyone has a different process, but it should be filtered and bottled at that point. So it stays 100% pure. Um, how it works, as I mentioned, is as you're breathing it in, that it, it crosses that blood-brain barrier and ignites that limbic system. So that's how that works, okay? Now, what are ways that you can use it? Because safety is really important because, you know, some people will say, well, essential oils, because they're natural, they can't hurt you. That's not true at all. There are some natural substances on, on the earth that can hurt us, right? I mean, who has walked through poison ivy, right? And then, you know, now you're itching and scratching and all these kinds of things, right? Nobody wants to be attacked by poison ivy, but it's a natural substance that comes from a plant, right? So we need to be cautious. You should work with someone who knows what they're doing in aromatherapy and who has the expertise. So you make sure that when you're using them with your loved ones or the residents you care for, that you are truly uh, being able to do that in an effective way that's safe, okay? So ways that you can use them, I'm just going to talk about two ways today. One is aromatically smelling it in and another is topically. When you're doing it aromatically, there you can diffuse with a regular diffuser, which you can get really anywhere. Um, you want to fill the water to the line. You put about four or five drops of the oil in the water, and then you turn it on. It's really that simple. When you fill the diffuser, please make sure you're using either filtered or bottled water because I think we all know that there's an allowable uh, level of metals in our tap water, and we don't want that hitching a ride into our brain, right? We don't want that toxicity. So it's important we use clean water in our diffuser. Um, we also at the Institute, we created an invention called personal diffuser dots, where it's uh, sticky on one side, it's felt on the other. And on the felt side, you put about four or five drops and you put it on the lapel of the person or the nightgown or collar, and they can walk around with a personal diffuser all day, which is great. So they don't have to stay in the room where the diffuser is. They can use it if you guys are going on an outing or if you are they're going from room to room or this person wanders a lot, they can use the diffuser at any time. And what's great is at about six to eight hours, you peel it off, throw it in the garbage, you can put another one on. So you only need about two or three throughout the day. Um, and then like I said, you can use it at night too and have them on their nightgown, which is wonderful. Um, also, people use, um, you know, uh, diffuser jewelry, necklaces, bracelets, you know, things like that too, which you can use. So just make sure it's a diffuser jewelry because you can't put oils on any kind of jewelry. Okay. Um, now let's talk about topical use. So if you're going to use it topically, you still want to do it around the neck area, around pulse points so they can still smell it in. Okay. Because again, aromatic is the, is the best in terms of, uh, helping the brain. So when we use topical, um, what you want to do is make sure that you dilute your essential oil. What I mean by that is you're going to use a carrier oil with the essential oil. You're going to mix it together in the palm of your hand. Okay. Um, the palm of our hand is, has much more padding than, of course, the other side of our skin and things like that. The reason you want to dilute is because as we get older, our skin thins. And so it's very sensitive for our elderly. We want to make sure that we're not causing any kind of extensive reactions because essential oils can be very powerful. So what you want to do is you can use a vitamin E oil, uh, fractionated coconut oil, jojoba oil, whichever you choose. I like fractionated coconut oil because it doesn't stain like on clothes and things like that. So and what you're going to do is you're going to mix with a 10 to 1 ratio, 10 drops of your carrier oil. You can see my hands here. 10 drops of your carrier oil, one drop of your essential oil. And I know that sounds like a high dilution, but with our vintage, we want to make sure that we're diluting uh, very well. Um, when we come to you and I, you know, we can do more of a 50-50. 
Uh, but with children and with elderly, we always say a 10 to 1 ratio. Okay, so mix it really good. And then you're going to apply it to your pulse point areas. So here at the neck, or you can actually put it on your wrist, you know, like we would any kind of perfume or cologne or something like that. I actually use essential oils as my perfume instead of actual perfume because there's a lot of toxins in perfume. So kind of swapping out those kind of uh, carcinogens and trying to use something more healthfully, right? Um, so with that said, you can use it topically too, all right? Now, when it comes to um, the essential oils, let's talk a little bit about, with the time I have remaining, real quick, what are oils we can use? So we recommend, I'm going to talk about uh, three oils. In the morning, we recommend a peppermint essential oil because it's very invigorating. So it allows that those nasal passages to open up. It brings more oxygen to the brain. It gets the person stimulated for the day, which is what you want in dementia care. You want them to get up, get energized, get ready for the day so they can be engaged. Um, and, you know, if they're in any therapies, if they're, um, you know, exercise, anything like that, you want to do all of that high energy stuff in the morning. And then peppermint's going to help with that. Um, and there's other kinds of mints that they don't respond well to peppermint for some reason, again, if they can still spell. Um Another oil you can mix with that in the morning is a citrus oil. So any citrus oil, which I mentioned before, increases appetite and boosts mood. A happy, hungry resident or person with dementia is the best recipe because you want them to eat and nourish themselves and you want them to be happy throughout the day, right? Um, and what's great about essential oils is they actually restore the body back to its natural balance. So if they don't necessarily need to be happy, but they need to be calm, the essential oil is going to help them with that because it does have a positive impact on mood, citrus do, right? So... So blending those two together is going to be great. Um, throughout the day, you really want to blend that, or excuse me, you want to diffuse that citrus oil, okay? So you want to keep that mood up. You want to keep that appetite going so they nourish themselves. So they don't necessarily decrease their appetite, okay? Um, and so from there, towards like the early afternoon, early evening, depending on if you're individual sundowns, you want to start diffusing lavender about 30 minutes prior, Okay, so the room fills or they get used to it on their personal diffuser dot or jewelry, something like that. Okay, you want to uh, diffuse that lavender and you can actually diffuse it all through the evening. Actually, when they're sleeping, if they do have sleep issues, which is very common as the disease progresses, you can diffuse that throughout the evening as they're sleeping. She and they can have a nice restful, nice sleep. They get up the next day and they're energized and ready to go again with that peppermint. This is really the best recipe. We call this the perfect day within the Dementia Connection model. You're setting them up for success by intentionally using essential oils to create this day where they're able to effectively move throughout the day. Now, what I found with the Dementia Connection model in my research is that not only does it have that immediate effect within seconds, but also about after four weeks, if you consistently use the same oils every day, they will actually identify that smell if they can still smell. They can identify that smell to know, oh, it's peppermint. It must be morning time. Oh, and I should be doing this. It's citrus. Oh, it's time to eat or it's time to play. Have fun, right? Lavender, it's time to calm down. They will start to learn that because they're learning from their senses now. They're not learning from textbooks or factual information. So about four weeks, if they can still smell, they will be able to learn that and be more productive. Again, another gift you can give someone with dementia is this perfect day. And that's where habilitation comes in, right? Because you are consistently using the same oils for the same purpose every day. And they're able to become more independent, right? That is fantastic. Um, and so I want to just close with that to say, thank you, Cheryl, for having me. I hope this was helpful in learning about the dementia connection model, how to use specifically olfactory stimulation. And we have a lot more to teach about all the other senses of how this can really help benefit not only the person you're caring for because they win with this, but you win as the caregiver because you now have tools you can use, which will build your confidence and your competence in caregiving, which overall everyone wins. It's a win-win. And you can certainly learn more about that in my book. So hopefully you can visit us at our institute, DementiaConnectionInstitute.org. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for having me again. This is always so much fun.